I welcome you to the world of British literature. Today, let's deal a poem written by Anne Bradstreet. The title of the poem is The Prologue. Let's first have an introduction about the poet. The poetess Anne Bradstreet was formerly known as Anne Dudley. She was the daughter of Thomas Dudley and was married to Simon Bradstreet at the age of 16 and became the mother of eight children. She was the most prominent poet of North America. She is the first woman to be recognized as an accomplished New World poet. She can be considered as the first Puritan in American literature known for her large corpus of poetry. Indeed, she has produced a very voluminous corpus of poetry, but yet most of her poems, they were published posthumously after her death. Now let's have an introduction about this particular poem, the prologue. So as you all know, a prologue is some sort of preface or introduction and this particular poem is known as a prologue. It is entitled as the prologue because it prefers to the volume of her poems which was published in 1650 under the name The Tenth Muse. And this particular poem is one of her most intellectually stimulating poems. It's actually a bold assertion of the poet's skill and her right to compose verse at a time when female poets were very rare in the Christian society. And the poetess claims to be a rising author in the realm of English literature through this poem. So let's now read the first stanza of the poem. Here goes the stanza. To sing of vast, of captains and of kings, of cities founded, commonwealths begun. For my mean pen are two superior things, or how they all, or each their dates have run. Let poets and historians set these forth. My obscure lines shall not so dim their worth. So this is a very humble beginning of the poetess. The poetess now tells, There are so great poets, very great historians, who speak about great things, superior things in the world, the very big subjects in the world such as wars, captains, kings, but she is so humble and tells that her obscure lines, they are very dim comparatively to those great poets and historians. So very modestly she declares herself as a very mean poet. She tells her obscure Lines of verse will not bring shame to those great subjects by attempting to describe them. So thus goes the beginning of the poem. Now let's read the second stanza of the poem. But when my wandering eyes and envious heart great Bata's sugared lines do but read over fool I do grudge the muses did not pat betwixt them and me that overfluent store. A batas can do what a batas will, but simply I according to my skill. So here too, the poet tells that the great French historian and poet Guillaume du Batas whose work was popular with Puritans because of its emphasis on Christian history. 
She compares her work with that of this great French historian, but she does not aspire to be his equal, but rather to be so simple and true to her skill. Now let us pass on to stanza 3. From schoolboy's tongue, no rhetoric we expect, nor yet a sweet consort from broken strings, nor perfect beauty where a mean perfect, a foolish, broken, blemished muse so sings. And this to mend, alas, no art is able, because nature made it so irreparable. So, here the poet makes an argument by stating and quoting an example. She tells that, we don't expect a mere schoolboy to be able to speak or write very perfectly a rhetoric or a carefully constructed argument. We also do not expect a musical instrument which has a broken string to produce a very sweet music, a very sweet harmonious sound. Likewise, Bradstreet says her own poetry is so broken it is blemished, imperfect, very foolish or naive. So it was created imperfect and beyond repair by Mother Nature herself. So you can feel how simple, how modest, how humble the poetess is. Now in stanza 4, the lines runs like this. Nor can I like that fluent sweet tongued Greek, who lisped at first in future times speak plain. By art he gladly found what he did seek. A full requital of his striving pain, art can do much, but this maxim's most sure. A weak or wounded brain admits no cure. So these lines are so touching. The poet makes a reference to an ancient Greek orator, Demosthenes, who was famous for having overcome a speech impediment. So in the same way that he worked to overcome his speech impediment, the poetess Bradstreet also worked to become a poet in a male-dominated world. So she does not think she is clever enough to create great poetry. So she tells she is just a lisping small poetess who is trying to overcome her weakness slowly and slowly. Now let us pass on to the next uh, stanza. So I think the poet, the poem has eight stanzas on the whole. And let us reserve the remaining four stanzas for the next class. So girls, have a read of the poem. The lines are so catchy, they are so inspiring for the girl students like you. So you too can have a try writing poems like Anne Bradstreet. Thank you girls.